So Michael, today is going to talk to us about peer-to-peer uh, -peer ecosystems, uh, some topics about uh, cosmolocalism, uh, civilizational transitions. So uh, yeah, Michael, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, kick it off? Uh, yeah, all right. So um, so first of all, you know, just uh, I'm a Belgian, if that's of any interest, uh, both Flemish and French-speaking parents. And 20 years ago, I moved to Chiang Mai, Thailand. Um, and I see a good old friend of mine who visited me here, Harrison Quigley. Good to see you there. <laughs> um, and um, I created the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation around 2005, which uh, is um, an observatory of all things peer-to-peer -peer and commons. Now, just to make clear, what I mean with peer-to-peer -peer is basically the capacity for non-territorial coordination. So the, the capacity that people now have to connect, communicate, organize, create new value streams uh, by connecting uh, to digital networks. And so create forms of organization and coordination that are no longer uh, bound um, with geography which I think is a you know, very important uh, pivot. Um, and yeah, so I think that's enough. And I'll, I'll just start with my, you know, my kind of narrative. So, so, so when I say non-territorial coordination, I, I, I think this is already something that you know, I want to stress how important it is because um, so basically civilization is a relation between the countryside and the city. Uh, you know, when we learned how to create excess production in, in agriculture that could sustain a uh, division of labor and craftspeople and priests and, and all of that, so kind of a more complex society, um, it was an organization of a geographic unit. And, and the peer-to-peer the -peer relationships that persisted were local, not, not global. So in other words, um, in order to manage complexity, we, we move to hierarchy because the, you know, the peer to peer communication doesn't scale. And so the fact that it now scales, that we can globally scale small group dynamics and create mega complex projects on a global scale. And, you know, even create network nations, uh, as it were, I, I, that is a, a kind of a, important change. Uh, in our civilizational history. So that's just something I, I, I want to stress. Um, so it's, you know, I sometimes say it started really for series in 93 because that's when the web and the browser came and, and the internet works became democratized, right? It, it existed before, you know, I think the chip is in 73 or 71. And, you know, there were like small networks like uh, CompuServe that were used by big multinationals, but the real peer-to-peer -peer extension of this technology to the people, that's 93. Um, and so, so why I'm saying this is because it's not new, it has been operating in our society for, you know, uh, 30 years. Um, and so, uh, it's already very present in the way we organize our society. So I usually show a quadrant that distinguishes the global, uh, the global centralized from the local distributed and for profit and not for profit priorities. So it gives you four formats, four ways of organizing uh, people and value that are existing and actually all coexisting and competing with each other. So the number one is global centralized, that would be what I call metarchical capitalism. So um, P2P front ends, but everything in the back is centralized and, and centrally owned and centrally controlled and surveilled and, and, and all of that. So the Facebook and Googles, Ubers and, and, and uh, Airbnbs of our world. Um, so I sometimes say we shifted from a Marxist uh, capitalism to a Proudhonian capitalism. Why? Because the idea that value is created by creating a surplus from human work is replaced by creating a surplus by taxing our transactions, right? It's, it's our peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and sharing 
that creates the value for these new types of companies who are now the dominant companies uh, in our system. So they have already adapted to you know peer to peer and sharing and collaboration paradigms, but they they extract uh, value from it. Uh, then the next thing would be for profit oriented but distributed, and that's of course the libertarian, proprietarian, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, uh, distributed ledger uh, sphere, um, which, you know, basic idea is that every human being can be an entrepreneur and, and should be able to link peer to peer without having third parties and monopolies and, and everything in between. Um, which of course is also very big. Uh, I think it went down from three trillion to one trillion, but it's a huge, uh, it's a huge economy, and and there are thirty four million digital nomads nowadays. And uh, where I live, Chiang Mai, the, before COVID, we had twenty five thousand people digital nomads here. We had four crypto meetings a week. Uh, you know, just so so this is a, a real a real thing, of course, uh, that is also uh, co evolving. Then I talk about the global not-for-profit orientation, and this is where I would put the global commons, the global knowledge commons, the commons of knowledge, software, and design. The Linux, the Linux Foundation, the Arduinos, you know, all these projects, the Wikipedias that are based on creating a, a global collaboration and sharing of knowledge. And in the bottom right, I put a, a local uh, not-for-profit distributed orientations and this is essentially urban or rural local commoning. Uh, I did a study in Ghent for the mayor there in 2017. There were 50 urban commons projects in 2008 and there were 500 of them in 2016. So a tenfold increase in urban commoning uh, in just 10 years. And in a city like Ghent, and you know it's not exceptional. It's 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 a special city, but it's not exceptional because I I, I checked many other places having the same dynamics. So you can find public provisioning, like let's say public housing, which is actually in retreat and in crisis. You can have private housing, which is largely unaffordable for the younger generations nowadays. And you also have now commons-based housing, co-op housing, co uh, co-housing, uh, all kinds of uh, alternatives in transport, food are available. So that is that is what is co-emerging. But as I said, there, there is a, a fair amount of extraction uh, of these new models going on. And so the commoners, so the people who are engaged in contributing to these peer-to-peer uh, -peer commons, have a certain interest in creating alternatives where there are more generative market forms that can coexist uh, with, with, with the commons. And so you could see another quadrant where you would have on the upper left, so the global uh, um, and centralized, the alternative to platform capitalism would be platform cooperativism, right? Uh, there have been like three conferences on it. Uh, the last one was in Rio. Uh, so basically, you do the same thing. You know, you create a platform where supply and demand can, can meet and can exchange and can share. Uh, but the platform itself is owned either by the workers or by multi-stakeholder formats. And so the, the surplus doesn't leave the platform. It, it can be reinvested uh, in the development of platform, in the income of, of, the, of the people exchange and produce value on those platforms. Within the distributed ledger place, I... I, you know, I work, for example, with Crypto Commons uh, Alliance, which are people who tweak the design of, of these uh, spaces um, because they have slightly different or sometimes radically different values. And so you can have smart contracts, but you can have Ostrom contracts. Um, so, you know, collective contracts rather than individual contracts. You can have uh, um, credit commons and, and mutual credit currencies instead of commodity currencies. So there's ways to design distributed ledgers from a different uh, value perspective. Um, okay, so then you, so when you look at the two other alternatives, the local and the global uh, not-for-profit oriented commons, 
Um, that's where uh, Michael, your notion. audio. Yeah, seems like you have some audio issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I there's not much I can do about it, or maybe close my video if that would help. Perfect. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Yes. And if need be, I can you know I can uh, close the video, which would be a shame. But um, all right. So so I introduced the concept of cosmolocalism. Um, and so the reasoning is the following. Uh, humanity spends three times as much on transport than on making. Uh, so our neoliberal globalization, where you know every product now is a mix of you know things that come from 40 different places and they move around thousands of miles. Uh, and so in, in the context of global overshoot, the idea of a subsidiarity of material production, right? Or of, of relocalizing, producing locally is attractive. And so the rule of cosmolocalism is everything that's heavy is local, everything that's light is global and shared. So it's basically the idea of combining an effort to re relocalize provisioning systems, uh, but keeping the complex cooperation at the level of knowledge, science, and technology. So you'd have distributed manufacturing and production at the base, but you would have what I call protocol co-ops, protocol cooperatives, uh, that basically are the, you know, like the Linux foundations and the Wikimedia foundations, which are like the, the commons of those projects that keep the protocols of cooperation, right? So. So you have a no, so you have economies of scope. Cap capitalism is based on economies of scale, producing more of a, of a product to keep to make it cheaper, but using more matter and energy to do this. Economies of scope is doing more with the same. And so the basic idea, of course, is that you um, any change in the network in terms of knowledge can be used by the whole network. So technological innovations move very fast, physically in the whole network. Uh, and people constantly learn from each other uh, through this uh, translocal uh, cooperation. Um, well, I hope that makes sense that we have a book about it, The Cosmo Local Reader, which has like maybe 40 case studies. And um, okay, so this is something I, I think is also important uh, to look at. I, I basically look at history as a competition between coordination systems. like. Very basically, and this is from Michael Hudson, who has a few books about this, you can look at history as a, you know, fairly long, millennia long struggle between the East Eurasian state-oriented imperial model based on social harmony and, you know, the good father, the, the emperor, which protects the people from the predations of the market. So markets are subordinated to the state. There are jubilees every 25 or 50 years to cancel the debts and liberate the slaves. And, uh, you know, this is all documented very well in the books of Michael Hudson. But in the West, the creditor class, the owner class took power in Greece. That created the revolution, which was Athenian democracy. And so in the West, we have a maritime, trading-oriented, market-oriented, antagonistic, but democratic system. And they've been fighting it out uh, for a very long time. And, and I would even read actually Ukraine as a shock of these two world systems uh, that are fighting it out. You know, the Russia-China axis where you can be an oligarch without the approval of the state. And in the West, you can be a politician without the approval of capital. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I think there's a lot of truth in, in what I'm saying. So these two systems, um, you know, have been battling it out market and state so it predates capitalism this this struggle predates capitalism where we have this tension uh, as the central tension of politics actually you know more state or more market is is a lot what politics is about but so what we're doing now is is revolutionary because we're introducing a third coordination system right we are introducing global mutual signaling as a coordination system stigmergy so we, we can adapt in real time to the behavior of other people without market pricing and planning commands. And so 
this is of course where crypto comes in, right? So all the stuff we're doing at open source and of which I see blockchain and, and as a continuation of it is actually creating infrastructures for this new coordination system to exist. First as part of the mix, but I'm going to argue that you know it might be the actually the the core attractor for the future, and so so why is that? So this is my theory that I call the pulsation of the commons. So civilization and societies move in cycles, ascending cycles, peak descending cycles. This is you know been happening since the Neolithic. It's very well documented. There's more than one cycle. Um, there's a cognitive cycle, 60 years. There's a hegemonic cycle, 150 years. There's a 16 generational cycle, which is very visible in Europe. Like every 500 years, there is a big shift in the socioeconomic system in Europe. It's very visible. Um, so there are different cycles. But the idea is the following. In the ascending cycle, markets and states do well, but they are extractive institutions based on competition and conquest. And they provide goods and services for the people in the core. Um, and in this, uh, in that context, the commons weakened. And maybe I should explain what the commons are, but I'll, I'll do that in a minute. When the descending cycle starts and the markets and states are less able to provide goods and services, then people uh, re-dynamize re re their, their local commons, right? So typical example, why, why is Switzerland and Austria and Japan so green? It's because the mountain flanks are commons and they're managed by the local villages so that they can use them for many, many generations. So the commons are the regenerative and the preserving institution and Marxist and states are the extractive institutions. And they always overshoot locally. We could move around. So you see the capitals of empires are always moving around every so many years because they have exhausted their, their core area. But the global system of capitalism has kind of escaped this for 400 years. And instead, we had serial exhaustion. But now we have the point of total exhaustion of, of peak uh, materials in different uh, levels and all the, the issues that we have in biodiversity and climate, everything. So, so, so the problem today is that we have an international state system, we have a transnational financial system, and this means that we can no longer change within the nation state. We can try, but if you would have a really radical alternative, within 100 days, your ATMs are, are empty. You know, it happened in many, many countries in the last two decades. So the, cap the capacity to, for change at the political level within the nation state is very weak. Uh, for example, Karl Polanyi used to talk about the lib lab cycle. So you, within, so you have the cognitive cycle, 30 years of high growth, good for labor, welfare reforms, but it ends with a, a supply chain uh, crisis. So uh, uh, capital doesn't make enough profit anymore. There's a break, there's a counter revolution, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. Then you get a financial uh, phase it's good for capital, it's not so good for the demand side, so it ends with a demand crisis, 1873, 1929, and 2008. And, and in those moments, those moments, you know, the, the, the forces would either pressure for the market to be primary or for the state to, to, to retake control. And that doesn't work anymore, right? And that's the crisis of politics. So here's my argument is that these protocol co-ops, these collaborations that we are creating uh, is actually the uh, an emerging counterpower at the global scale. I call it magisteria of the commons. So there's a commons gap. And so we need to, to, to create these cosmolocal uh, commons as a, first of all, as a counterpower uh, but I think eventually, as the the regenerative uh, infrastructure that protects human and non-human communities from overuse. Um, so another way to look at this, right? So we had the immature biosphere, 
many millions of years ago. And then uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, I'll, I'll, you know, but so we had a great oxygenation event and then other stuff happened and life started connecting with each other in a kind of cooperative biology, right? And it created Gaia, uh, the earth system, which is a homeostatic system, which is able to react to disturbances and maintain life. So, so we went to a mature biosphere. The biosphere creates humanity and culture and the technosphere. But we have a technosphere which endangers the, the biosphere, right? So the shift, I think, this transition is the shift towards a mature technosphere. If we, if we, if we realize that, then we can live for a million of years in balance with nature. And so I, I don't want to exaggerate uh, it, but I do think that the crypto infrastructure with, with all its flaws and its avarice and you know many things that are embedded in it that, I, that we could critique is essentially our attempt to create this coordination system. And if AI has any good usage, the, that will be one of the key uses of it. It's the feedback system from the biosphere to the technosphere, right? So, so to, to teach us, to let us know with maximum distributed freedom, how far we can go in you know, servicing human needs within planetary boundaries. Um, okay, I, I want to say maybe one more thing, which is, so, so crypto for me is that, right? So in the crypto sphere, I wrote this report called P2P Accounting for Planetary Survival. And it shows that there are three new accounting systems emerging, which are responding to this need. First of all, contributory accounting. So this is an old research thing that we did already like seven years ago, it was called P2P value, 300 pre-production communities, already then 75% of them had or were experimenting with contributory accounting. So it's basically in an open source system, there's always people don't get rewarded for their contribution. And contribution is actually the key for an open source system, not a commodity economy. So you have basically the, the knowledge commons is what creates the value. And then around the, the commons, entrepreneurs can create added value for the market, right? Because by definition, normally speaking, a non-rival resource, a abundant resource doesn't create a tension between supply and demand, and there's no market mechanism for it. It's, it's in the scarcity field around it, the products and services that you can create around it that can create a dynamic market. And it has to be, an, it has to be a generative market, generative market that doesn't destroy and weaken the commons, right? So, so the commons economy is, a, is not a commodity economy. It's a contributive economy, which has markets and state functions around it, but itself, it's a contributive economy. And that, and that is the value shift that we also are going through from a commodity uh, paradigm to a contributive uh, paradigm. So contributive accounting is the answer to that, is, is to recognize non-market contributions within a network system of value. Second, flow accounting. So accounting is how we see and manage the world, right? So the, the first accounting was a tablet in Sumeria you know, you know, it's the temple that manages the in and out flow of grain. And it's the creation of the state. The state was created through accounting. And it's a separate institution from the, from the people. Then in the 14th or 15th, 15th century, uh, a Franciscan monk, Lucio Pacci or Paccio, creates double entry book accounting. And he creates capitalism. But it's a, it's a closed entity that can see the profit and capital that is increasing or decreasing for its own needs. So it's an artistic accounting. Now we have flow accounting, 3D accounting, resources, events, agents. So and there's no double entry, but everybody can see his transaction within the 3D environment, right? And then you add to that mix thermodynamic accounting, which is the ability to see the flows of matter and energy and the, and the global thresholds and allocations that limit human usage uh, of these resources. Um, 
So, so the crypto world, the open source world, we are building these resources, I think, and we're creating this emerging economy that represents, you know, the future. Um, and you know, I'm not saying it's a pure thing; it's, it has a lot of contradictions, but that that is the necessity and the the promise of it. Now, I do want to make some uh, some critiques, um, in um, you know, as a reaction to it, which is. I think a lot of crypto is motivated by by exodus. In other words, a cognitive elite that thinks it can thrive and survive without the people. And lots of crypto work is on this cognitive level. You know, what are we going to do with our money? How are we going to make decisions with our money? I think that's just a profound weakness because the, the 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 problem today in our Western society, especially, is the split between the cognitive and the physical, between the virtuals and the physicals, between the nowheres and the somewheres, right? So we have a working class which has been battered by uh, deindustrialization, which is less educated, less able to use computers. Um, and is moving uh, to the populist uh, parties. And then we have a cognitive elite, an urban elite, an educated elite, uh, which is through its digital knowledge, better able to, to move around uh, in the digital world and to beat its challenges. And to some degree, crypto is a secession of the elites. And I think that's a, not a good thing. Um, by the way, just, for those who like history, the secession of the plebs is actually, you know, what what the poor would do in Rome. They actually left the city six times to force the the patricians to listen to their demands, right? And so Rome couldn't function without them, and then they would obtain uh, social reforms. But Christopher Lash in, in the seventies he started talking about the what was it called the the culture of narcissism about the secession of the elites. So. Here's what I think is something you know that I call for my wishes. We we have this growth of urban commoning, the growth of protocol co-ops of these urban commons. And they're not using crypto, and crypto is not doing anything for them. So I, I think this is should be a priority, is to create everywhere, uh, uh, you know, organic technological intellectuals that in this cosmolocal paradigm connect the global knowledge streams and commons to the needs of local communities. Um, and, you know, um, I'm actually in touch with a group like this, and, and I, I can't tell you a lot, but there's a Chinese diaspora group, uh, the Global Chinese Commons, that is renting or buying you know, a number of properties for co-working and community spaces around the world, fully managed with crypto uh, governance techniques. So they, they govern the physical through crypto, which I think is very, very interesting. And they're a network nation. You know, they, they have this identity and they have a very specific uh, plan, which is to connect with local communities. So to use the digital class to connect with the local communities. This is what I'm talking about. So this is the kind of stuff that I'm, I'm looking for, this connection between the physical and the uh, and, and the digital. And, and I don't think crypto is doing a, enough uh, of that. So I see the question, a uh, global Chinese commons uh, is the name. I don't know if it's an official name, but I, I saw that on documents and they have actually a center here in Chiang Mai which is called 4Cs.io. There's not a lot visible to the outside, but it's it's an interesting uh, project. All right, so I'll just finish with two historical examples. Uh, well, actually, let's say it's the same. So I can remember when I think it was in the first century, Hannibal uh, from Carthago, uh, you know, the Phoenician city at the other side of the Mediterranean, invaded Rome, Italy, and basically destroyed the countryside. It never recovered, and it shifted from smallholder agriculture to wine and olive growing 
slave uh, latifundias, basically. And they never recovered. Despite all the attempts to, you know, restore agriculture, it never worked. And, and the food came from, from Egypt. When Rome fell in the fifth century, there was no food. And then one, one person, later called Saint Benedict, who had been a prefect in Rome, as a Christian had moved to the countryside to, you know, to meditate, was called back and created the Benedictine rules. So this was a protocol of cooperation. And the first monastery, I think, is called Monte Cassino. Within 50 years, through viral spreading of this model, of this basically agricultural co-op, he restored what well, they restored, Italian agriculture. In the 11th century, the Sister Sengers did the same. They... Um, uh, basically, 70% of the land was recovered for agriculture. And again, in like 50 to 70 years, was done, uh, but through a similar way. So one protocol of cooperation and viral spreading is a very powerful way to transform a society. And I think that's what we're all trying to do in some way. And so I'm, I'm you know, I'm really honored to talk before a group of people who are trying to move the needle and you know it may seem a long and hard road but at the same time you know evolution is non-linear and uh, we are standing in front of a extraordinary acceleration of human history because all the cycles are concatenating i don't know if that's the right word in english but all the cycles are actually synchronizing now at the same time to create a meta crisis with global catastrophic risk but also with enormous potential for change. And so I believe in seeds that are exemplary of the new paradigm and that eventually connect to each other and eventually create a new society. I think that's probably enough. Um, so I'm open to comments and, and contributions and eventual questions. Excellent, excellent. I thought that was amazing. Um, so, much, so much comes to mind. Um, but yeah, before we go ahead and open up uh, conversation and questions address the audience. Uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and kick one off. So, um, so you know, we talk about uh, civilizational transitions. Um, and, you know, it's very interesting because you know there's many that take the position that the transition from uh, you know more local and subsidiary economies like you know guild economies, those sort of things, um, you know, uh, as that transitions into a more um, you know global um, you know economy, that was really you know there was various ideological and, uh, you know, economic forces, you know, like those a lot of, uh, you know, liberal capitalists at the time really thought that, you know, subsidiarity was in a sense suppressive, you know? Um, so I'm really, really interested to, to hear your opinion on, um, you know, moving forward, you know, um, I think there's a lot of uh, lessons we can learn from, you know, cosmolocalism and, um, you know, a lot of uh, various, you know, uh, different um, schools of thought, but I'm curious to see how um, you approach reconciling um, some potential antagonisms between, um, the local interests and global interests. Um, I know that there is one parallel um, school of thought uh, called distributism, it's also known as localism recently, that seeks to uh, expand ownership of commons uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and people as a, as a way to, um, you know, transition into more uh, subsidiary based uh, order. But yeah, just curious to hear your opinion. Um, well, I'm, I'm kind of a, a, cr a critic of a pure localist approach, because I don't think it will work. And, and there are several reasons for that. Uh, first of all, if you look at history, you know, the... So the empires, you know, they they bring... I, I know this is controversial, but I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's empirical. They bring peace and order in a large area. So they bring down the level of violence to a substantial level. Uh, and they create prosperity. And, and they have intricate, complex knowledge. When that knowledge disappears, the population just, you know, uh, goes down catastrophically. Um, so there, there are studies in, in Peru that, you know, the, when the Inca Empire contracted, you know, for example, you know, they have this complex knowledge of these 50, so, you know, they have this kind of, uh, what's it called? 
like level up uh, agriculture, you have like 50 different, you know, uh, altitudes. And each altitude is, a, you know, generates a different bio microclimate. The, the local tribes couldn't do this, right? So when the Inca control stopped, like 90% of the population would disappear. So this is one. Uh, second, you know, we are competing. We are not alone. So you can have a thriving commons or try to have a thriving commons. Let's say, you know, the Sine Gambia fishermen, they, you know, they've been doing this for, for many hundreds of years. But as long as you have these big Russian and Chinese and probably American and English ships and Japanese ships, you know, industrially fishing and emptying out your ocean just outside of the, the national miles, you're not going to make it. Um, and so I, I argue that we, we need to be technologically, scientifically uh, uh, complex to compete with, with the existing system. We can't just like, you know, retro romantically, you know, think about, um, I mean, some people can do it, you know, I have nothing against people that go back off grid and, and are happy to do that. But as a kind of societal solution, I think it's, um, it's, it's not enough. And then the third ar argument is, you know, we're trapped. We have nuclear, uh, you know, stations, I don't know how many in the world, which require very, very complex knowledge just to maintain them. And if we don't maintain them, you know, radioactivity would spread everywhere. So we, we kind of condemned to really think, uh, you know, about what is the mix between local and cosmic. We can't just not abandon, we cannot abandon the cosmic level because that's a depository of that complex knowledge. Um, so that's why I argue not just for localism, but for cosmolocalism, you know, uh, which is localism, but enhanced by all the technological and scientific knowledge that we have obtained. And I do think that, you know, so you have the cycle, right? Up and down. This is, this is uh, true, but it's also empirically true that there is a scaling across time. So you look at cities. And you would see over time they scale. The sizes of, of you know empires over time they scale, right? So there is like uh, so so human evolution until now has been spiraled, a spiral. So that means there is a depository of knowledge. And there's actually a thesis which I believe is correct. It's called central civilization. So these networks of cities in the Eurasian uh, you know core has never disappeared. So when Rome fell, Byzantium was there. You know, when when uh, Byzantium fell, there was some. So there was always like a depository where the kind of like high civilizational knowledge remained. You know, and you sure it went up and down as well. But overall, there is, the, you know, the cycle. But within the cycle, there is an hour of time. And so, I, yeah, so I, I think that, um, you know, I don't know if we can avoid a dark age, uh, but I think we should try to, and, 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 you know, try to avoid, you know, the more, more catastrophic scenarios. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I think, um, you know, to, to what we we're saying now, uh, one thing you used to mention earlier that really, I think, uh, you know, made a lot of sense, you know, click to me is um, hard local, soft global i think that makes a lot of sense and i think that is wise um you know one thing you know, just you know historically too i mean uh you know the roman empire was able to provide defense for one percent tax tax rate which i think is you know it's, it wouldn't be possible for you know something uh you know governance that's more local but uh yeah definitely seeing the the common ground middle ground where we can enhance both uh is you know very interesting but uh yeah looks like we have some questions in the audience uh artem um go ahead why, why don't you ask your question Maybe before I ask my question, we can quickly try to answer Praveen's question. Can we define localization beyond the physical sense? I mean, the question in the chat, it kind of connected to the previous question, so I don't want to kind of ignore it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So yeah, so it looks like Praveen asked, uh, can we define localization beyond the physical sense? If so, what properties would describe local, regional, and global? Um, 
Um, how do various oh oh yeah just w one last line how do various and uh finally how do various variables relate differently to local versus global commons right okay i'm so i, I i'm gonna use a bit of provocative and, and controversial language um so first of all the digital and the physical have different properties right so the the knowledge sphere is non-rival and anti-rival. Um, so, and I'm sorry, you know, people with bad experiences uh, with Russia and stuff, but so I'm just using a technical definition of Marx when he defined communism as, you know, from, from everyone according to his contribution to everyone according to his need or something like that, right? So it means that you have like a thing that everybody can use and it's not a problem. There's no, there's no loss. Right, so the, the the global sphere is a sphere of pure sharing. I mean, you 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 can have IP if you want to, and I actually advocate not for pure sharing, but some I so you have copyright and copy left, and I actually argue for copy fair, but that's another discussion. Uh, so I think that semi semi protected commons uh, make sense to create cooperative networks, because otherwise, if everything is open multinationals are using your commons and they have more capital to outcompete you. So that's okay. That's that's an idea. But but so so that you cannot you cannot manage the scarcity based physical in the same way that you manage the abundant digital sphere. Right? So yeah you need different rules for both. I think that's a, a big difference. And the cosmoloco is about how you best mix those two levels. Um, okay, so um, I, I think there's another thing that is important, which you, you know, the, so you have entropy and extropy, right? So entropy is the tendency of the universe to degrade over time, and and so the more we use something, uh, you know, for humans the more we eventually degrade the overall system around it. You know, we 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 use high quality matter and we degrade we degrade the matter. Uh, and okay, I'm not an expert in this, but so everybody that is that does ecology tells me that you can only restore, you know, regenerate at a local level. Right? So if we want healthy soils, it's local. You know, it's just local. You, you, you need healthy soils. You have to do it locally. So we need to care for our environment. That that is a that is a local thing. But the way I see it is, you know, you have permaculture. You have your feet in the mud, super local. Your heart is in your community. All the other people around you doing permaculture, but your brain is in the global permaculture knowledge exchange, right? And so that that is the combination. It's it's not op opposed to each other. It's complementary to each other. Um, and I do think that local communities, over time, tend to be less innovative. And so that's why you need regular input from the outside. Um, and a lot of innovations. I you know there was a book about it. I forgot, uh, and I didn't actually read it, but I looked in, into it. And it, it gave many examples of like, you know, technical innovations came from people who actually moved in the region. Like they were not originally from that place. It's outsiders that innovate. So for all these reasons, I believe we, we need a mix. And I, I think we need to keep the, you know, the planetary sphere uh, as something that is a good thing. Um, and I think the problem that people have in general is that, you know, the, the world government, the fear of a world government, right, is a fear of, of a global centralized force that would oppress everybody. And that's why, you know, the system that I propose with these three layers, like stigmergy at the bottom, generative markets, and then a contextual planning is a system that I think allows the maximum amount of freedom while preserving the physical balance of the planet, right? Because if we don't do it, then the only alternative will be rationing. 
and so you know I, my heart is for distributed solutions and i see these commons uh the magisteri of the commons as democratic contributive translocal you know participatory institutions now if you look at the floss foundations they usually democratically run you know there's there's votes you know so they're they're run they're not run as dictatorships they run as civil organizations and and you know maybe maybe the cryptosphere with all the things they're inventing you know can can improve uh on these kind of old-fashioned you know non-governmental forms of, of of participation because i do think to a large degree you know that they're there these are old models that we need to innovate excellent excellent so yeah artem why don't you go ahead and ask your question yes thank you so much uh michelle thank you very much for the talk uh it's a great honor to be able to learn from you and ask you a question and um you know, I, I really like the book uh, by David Bollier, uh, Free, Fair, and Alive. Uh, I'm sure you know about it. And someone told me that you had uh, like a disagreement with David because I think he is very adamant that commons should be distinct from commerce. And I, as far as I understand, you don't agree with that. So I was just very... So, it's, so if the, you don't dispute, mind, could you please yeah, talk about that? Yeah, the dispute bit. is between, you know, what is the right relationship between commons and markets, right? Um, David, but especially Silke, who, who died uh, two years ago, they're, they're more purists. That's, that's what I would say. In other words, you need to defend the commons from any contamination from the market. And my answer to that is that within capitalism, this condemns the commons to marginality. And you know, one of the brilliant things that I think Bitcoin has done, and you know, crypto in general, is to actually create income for people doing open source development. Uh, because you know, so we need capital for the commons. We you know, from commons for capital, so the commons exploited by capital, like a uh, Airbnb and Uber, we need reverse cooptation. We we need capital, right? That's not necessarily capitalism, you know, which is a particular way you know, of dealing with capital, but we need capital, resources to develop the commons. And for me, that requires a healthy relationship between market and commons. So I talk about generative markets. I think markets are distinct from capitalism. And capitalism is based on markets, but there have been markets before capitalism. And these were markets that were more embedded in the society. Um, and I, I think that balance has been lost. Um, and so I think that the idea of keeping commons pure is actually very, is counterproductive. It's like, I, you know, I call it hippie commons. Uh, sorry for the hippies. I, you know, I don't have nothing against the hippies, but you probably know what I mean by that, right? It's, it's, uh, it's idealism. But you know, if you want to live with your children and your elders and reproduce over time, you have to think through, like, you know, realistically how you survive in a hostile environment, right? And so that's that would be the way I explain my difference. You might have another way to to talk about it. And so you know, I get accused of being, uh, you know, pro-capitalist and neoliberal and and. Which is, you know, I, I disagree. That's not at all my point. I, I'm, I'm saying we need healthy markets that work for the commons, and we, we cannot leave the markets to the capitalists. That's what I'm saying. We need to have our own markets as commoners. You know, we need to build these entities that allow us to make a living while continuing to do the sharing and the open source. You know, not do it after you know, like when you're a student. Uh, or when you're unemployed, no, no, we we have to do commons when when we are working. You know, it's this it's our life. Excellent. Looks like we have a couple questions here. So, um, yeah, Daniel. Um, 
Yeah. Um, Michael, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm loving these. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the, the characteristics or what you think is necessary for an embedded market. I can think about it in, in a relatively easy to understand term geographically, uh, but if we move outside the geographic layer, um, what can we think about? So a market behaves in, and continues to behave uh, as a local or generative market. And, oh, okay. and I don't know if this has some relation to the value, value, value flows accounting, which I would love to ask, but maybe that pushes us too far and there's more people and limited time. Uh, so I, I proposed a few things a few years ago, which I, I think makes sense. Uh, so one is based is the idea of a reciprocity based licensing. So basically what you would do is you would split the knowledge sharing from the commercialization rights. So, you know, to make it very easy, you have a non-commercial creative commons license. So everybody can use your knowledge, but if you, you want to make, oh, I see Nina is there as well. Hello. <laughs> Uh, I hadn't seen it before. Um, when when you uh, how to say this? Um, I lost my thread because I saw Nina and my, uh, yeah. my brain. You, 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 uh, yeah, you you, you were talking about the, yeah you were talking about the non-commercial knowledge sharing. But oh yeah, yeah. And, then, and then commercialization yeah. would be subject to some kind of condition of reciprocity, right? So. Uh, it's stronger reciprocity than, than what you have in an open source license. Um, but it could be very simple, like you, you pay some money to be part of the association and that funds the association and then you know that, that funds the collective infrastructure. So, th so that's one thing. But then the other thing is we can create entities that have you know, some protection building like uh, B corporations, social entrepreneurs, solidarity economy, cooperative economy, um, mission-oriented enterprise, right? I, I think these are all ways that we are trying to, to domesticate the animal spirits of a pure for-profit uh, entity. Um, and I specifically also talked about open co-ops because even co-ops have been diagnosed already you know, since the beginning of the 20th century. So managerialism and worker capitalism. So managerialism means that over time, co-ops do create an elite and that elite loses touch with the membership. And before you know it, it's, it's only a coping name. And, you know, most people are just working for a wage and they're passive. And then a worker capitalism means you, you, you're still competing and you start behaving because of it, like an ordinary for-profit company. So typically Mondragon, you know, when they go to Poland, they don't want to share uh, their co-op shares with the Polish workers. So they hire the Polish workers at minimum wage. And then the, the Polish workers strike against Monrego, right? That shouldn't happen uh, in, in a co-op, in my view. So uh, the idea of an open co-op is to structurally and legally force yourself as a co-op to create commons. So for example, if you, uh, if you align yourself with free software, then you still you still contribute to the commons, even if you become managerialist and worker capitalist, you're still producing for the common good at the same time. Um, or a, a, a really good example was in uh, in Quito. So there's a large housing co-op in Quito, very poor people. So instead of paying money for the house, they pay in time, and they need to work 100 hours uh, a year. For the co-op, so the, you know they help to construct the houses and and and, but they also actually clean the the, the ravines around their housing co-op. So in in, in uh, Quito, you don't really see it, but you know it's flat. But actually, it's like with ravines and people throw out their their trash. And so by cleaning the ravines and creating public parks and then donating the public park. To the public, not only do they help themselves, they have a nice park next to their housing co-op. It heightens the value of their housing and they create a service for others. Does that make sense? 
So I think we should, you know, we should think in that way, like, okay, so yeah, we are a market. We need, we, 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 okay. And so don't forget, not for profit doesn't mean no profit, right? So you have for profit, non profit, but not for profit is in between. It's all those entities which can create a surplus, but their goal is not to accumulate and to create uh, dividends for shareholders. Their goal is their purpose, their mission oriented. Right, and actually, you you go back to the history of corporations. Originally, corporations were mission oriented. They 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 had to obtain a royal charter for a particular purpose. That that was the original meaning of a corporation. They were mission oriented, and I I think we we should think about you know modern forms of. And so, for example, in Germany, I met people, you know, and it's actually called mission oriented enterprise. So they they. They protect the leadership, the ethical leadership of the founders, and they keep the capital separate from the corporate structure, right? So they can accept capital and they can reward capital, but the capital has no voice. It cannot degrade the mission of the enterprise. So I, I think there's lots of things we can do to you know, rethink what a corporation is, what a for-profit is, and to make... So if you recognize as a company that you're interdependent and codependent on the commons, then it's actually in your self-interest to become generative. Excellent, excellent. Looks like um, we have a question from Nina, then we'll have uh, a question from uh, the text from Paul. But yeah, go ahead, Nina. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't owe you, Daniel. I, I hadn't got mm -hmm. your name yet. Sorry, mm -hmm. I Daniel. And then hello, Michelle. Lovely to uh, lovely to see you. Um, interesting real life case study rolling out for me. We've got a whole kind of read, uh, district network of co-ops that we're um, looking to explore the notions of you know from shareholder value down to even pricing in the community and i just want to support exactly what what you are what you are saying about needing the market consoli consolidation as a, a, a reference point but where interesting nominal um, explorations in local pricing can be that first sort of exploration of um, firewalling uh, over, you know, uh, badly overpriced products. I'm talking about agricultural produce and where we formalize the notion of far more accessible pricing for locals who contribute within the local economy, you know. So there are all these kind of incentives to actually be enter into the cooperative mentality and to participate in this new experimentation of true bottom-up leadership but with links yes with those links and and reference points um, because part of the profit mechanism of the cooperatives will have to be profit-led commercial um, but then it's it's the allowance of the inclusion of the social and developmental and co you know that cooperative co uh, community building notion and a recognition of um, resource con constraints that that acts as a kind of care economy and a solidarity economy. So you know I, I think for those purists like David Bollier, gosh. Um, does he live on a, you know, does he live in a kind of remote place that he's romanticized it to that that degree? It's kind of interesting. I, I really support your more, um, the, the, the gradient that you allow for sensibly, which is urban lifestyles, which cannot escape, uh, you know, and cannot apply the purism of David Bollier. So I really appreciate your median interpretation of, you know, of these elements. So you, I remain a fan. Uh -huh. <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Just, just for the non-insiders, we, you know, I was in South Africa recently. So yeah, I, I know Nina there. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Nina. Wonderful, wonderful. So yeah, it looks like we have one question from Paul. So 
how do we change this fear of new world order into something that can support, uh, uh, can provide support at a local common level? Uh, how do we contain the strongman issues, uh, BRICS versus West? That's yes, a lot of questions. Um, yeah. So, so I, I kind of dream, this is my own utopia, like a fractal organization. Um, so um, in, in, in Italy, you have the first ever, uh, you know, pro-commons public regulation. It's called the Bologna Regulation uh, for the Protection and Regeneration of Urban Commons or something like that. Okay. So basically, it's now emulated by 250 Italian cities and it mobilizes 1 million Italian people. So it's, 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 a, you know, it's a big thing. So you have a city lab or a commons lab and any group of citizens can uh, propose a commons project and say, we want to clean up the river. We want to improve this old uh, abandoned factory. We want to make the park better, et cetera, et cetera. So, the, you know, they... So it's about urban renewal and innovation and all of that. So the second step is there is a contract, a, a commons contract, basically, that you know specifies rights and duties of, of the parties. For example, you know, I, I saw this again, it may, may seem like trivial, but you know, a group of people took over a park. So it was a commons park, and they wanted animals, and they had you know two pigs. And they were common pigs because they had these uh, long, long tails. They weren't stressed, so they didn't have the curly, uh, the you know, the curly uh, tails of, of industrial pigs. Um, and and of course, the bureaucracy, you know, was worried about animal uh, abuse and abandonment. So, or, all right, it's you know, it's a regulation. So they agreed. We promise to take care of these uh, animals over many years. And so that's the commons contract, right? Rights and obligations. And it's important because even Ostrom said, you know, you cannot survive as a commons if you have the public authorities against you because they'll, you know, they'll just send the police. So you, you need to find some some way, you know, accommodation with, with the powers that be, right? Okay, so then the next step is that the city mobilizes a support coalition and it's called the five-star model, not a five-star party, the quintuple helix model, the city, the commercial sector, the academic sector, and the for, the formal nonprofit sector, all four mobilized to help the fifth sector, which is the informal civic common sector, right? So it can be money, it can be adapting regulations, it can you know give space or buildings and, and, and all kinds of stuff. So imagine you have this and, and you tackle every provisioning system because this is what we need to do. We need to mutualize provisioning system. So for example, shared cars, you know, not Uber, but like associations and co-ops, every shared car replaces nine to 13 private cars. So, he, so you have a neighborhood, you can make an agreement in the neighborhood and says, let's reduce our cars. Everybody can drive. So you, you don't lose the freedom to drive and point to point advantage of having a car. But you have, you know, I don't know. So I'm not good at math, but, uh, you know, five times less cars, right? So you only pay 20% for the same right. And you only use 20% gas, metal, rubber right so so this is what we need to do like systematically at the urban and rural level you know mu intelligent mutualization of provisioning systems using this support infrastructure this quintuple helix infrastructure right so then you have like a transport co-op or whatever are, are you going in every city to invent a wheel no you'll have a protocol co-op right so you have like a a league of cities that mutualizes their, their collaboration to create these things, and they need the same infrastructure, right? So you have like this quintuple helix at the Cosmo, again, at the Cosmo local level. That's the way I see it. And, and it's a marriage of commons, 
you know, private entrepreneurship, eventually generative private, you know, uh, forms, and 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 public support. I think that would be like the, for me the ideal situation. And and so the the role of the state, if you like, of public authorities, is to enable and empower local autonomy, uh, individual and social autonomy. So not a welfare model, which is like a consumption model, you know, where the state provides a service which are consumed, but a model of you know invigorating, supporting, creating the conditions for this flowering of civic uh, and entrepreneurial activity. Excellent, excellent. Do we have anyone else that wants to ask a question? Before we cap things off, no. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. I guess I'll just uh, go ahead and maybe, close. Maybe up. just help uh, Daniel clarify the fifth uh, layer. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I did not quite understand the context of that. Oh. Um, yeah. So, so I would say yes, so Daniel. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I'm, I'm I'm just missing one of the five. I think. I, I so the last one like... is. So the, the, the public, the commercial, the That's academic, right. the nonprofit, and they support the fifth, which is the civic. Gotcha. Thank you. Excellent. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting pattern. I hadn't thought about it more for micro organization design, uh, like let's say, uh, yeah, DAO design and so on, and makes a lot of sense as a as a fractal pattern. Thank you so much, Michael. This has been fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Take care. Chat. Chat. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Alan, right. for moderating. Yeah. Bye. And thank Absolutely. you. Uh, and bye-bye, Harrison. Come back to Chiang Mai. The haze <laughs> is gone. It's you know it's beautiful <laughs> weather. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, let me know when this is shared uh, online. It, just a quick comment before everybody leaves. Uh, I'm in the U.S. and I've been researching the U.S. corporate entities. And like Michelle mentioned, there's the a benefit corporation or in Oregon is called a social purpose corporation, uh, which is that not for profit rather than nonprofit or for profit. It's a, the one in the middle. And, and uh, also, I've, I've found that. Um, in certain states, there's something called the um, home rule, where you can form a municipality. You can actually, ha actually have a municipal corporation that writes its own ordinances and so forth. The only, uh, you know, it makes your, your uh, local community basically sovereign. Of course, it has to stay within federal and, and state laws but a lot of times when you're trying to create something in a city you're running into all the unnecessary city uh regulations that you know stop you from doing gray water or whatever right whereas if you form your own city your own municipality you write your own ordinances so what i've done is i've combined a producer an employee-owned producer cooperative as a municipality. A municipality can engage in uh, what's called market activities, provided that it's for this, the common good. Well, there's many things that are in the common good. Housing, jobs, education, food production, so a municipal corporation can engage in those activities for its community. So it sort of combines all five of the things that uh, Michelle has pointed out. Just wanted to mention that. Yeah, great. Yeah. You know, let a hundred flowers bloom, right? <laughs> Say again. All right. Let a hundred flowers bloom. It's, yes. uh, sorry for the reference. It's actually from Mao. <laughs> and, <laughs> And so then, then they did, and they, they basically put them all in the concentration camps afterwards. It was a trick to get the people come out. <laughs> anyway, uh, a sad episode from uh, 
1980s, I think, or the 70s. All right. So uh, are we we going right? Because it's uh, it's yeah. like midnight thirty yeah. almost here. So I, it's <laughs> yes. getting late. All right. Can, Thank you for being with I us. Can I make one? Yeah. Can I make one more um, remark just now, b b bouncing off Harrison's Harrison's idea? Um, what you've what you've just identified is um, emerging in South Africa again, where uh, top down failure to govern has resulted in such um, provocative kind of bottom up contestational moves. And I'll give you a wonderful example. Uh, a group of 600 homeless people got so sick and tired of the lack of attention from the local government authorities that they put 300 rand, which is, you know, that's like $5 aside um, every month. And together they bought their own 33 hectare stand of land and have literally done exactly what you say, Harrison. They have taken ownership from housing. They've gone as far as to get reserve bank, mind you, reserve bank recognition of a small um, local uh, municipal bank that they've now cash flowed. And it's the most amazing, interesting model, not yet linked to crypto or some distributed crypto formation, Michelle, but I am I watching that with a hawk eye to see how that emerges because they've got the land as, as you know, as a territorial asset. Now they're adding all the educational layers, Harrison. This speaks to, you know, the, the potential. Um, yeah. it, it's quite a provocative if, technique. If I, may, if I may suggest one thing is to look at Will Ruddick's uh, project, uh, Sarafu, uh, in Kenya, South Africa, and different places, because it's, you know, it's a currency system that is based on the savings groups of local women. That's it. They use as collateral to create extra complementary currency, which yeah. is trusted because of the collateral. And then they add the blockchain to make all the streams visible which now generates support from the outside because people can see how how their money is multiplying and, and getting so many people out of poverty. So this kind of mix, you know, of the real concrete with, with the blockchain, that's the kind of things that I'm looking 